Okay, open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 77, verse 1, is where we resume our study here, going verse by verse through the book of Psalms. Psalm 77, verse 1, Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name, amen. The writer says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. If we are Christians, and if there are no unconfessed sins in our life, and if we cry out to God with humility and faith, then He will hear us. He may not give us everything we ask for, for reasons known only to Him. However, He will hear us, and since He is loving, we should be comforted knowing simply that He hears us. If we know that He hears us, we can trust Him to do what is best. That's what living by faith is all about. Living by faith is not asking God for something in prayer and then becoming angry when He doesn't give us what we want. Living by faith is obeying Him, asking Him for things, and trusting Him whether His answer is yes or no. Verse 2, When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out my untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. Who in the world likes distress? Not I. But God certainly does use it. And there are times when God's people are too sad and too overwhelmed with troubles to even sleep. So what should we do? We should pray. Can you think of a better alternative? Laying there worrying sure isn't the answer. So we pray. And during those times, we want God to do something, anything. Or at, le at least reassure us that He's still there and that He still cares about us. Verse 3, I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. The writer could not put his feelings into words. The best he could do was groan. Sometimes we are so overwhelmed with trouble that it's really hard to pray. At least in words, all we can do is groan. But our compassionate God hears those groans. And He knows why they are there. And He translates our groans into words. Words which we can't even utter. Verse 4, you kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. And there it is again. Sleepless nights, they are not that unusual for God's people. The Apostle Paul had many sleepless nights. He often stayed awake, praying about the things that concerned him. God does not promise His faithful people eight hours of sleep. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and He promised His faithful followers the same sort of existence. God calls His people to suffer with Him and for Him, and sometimes that involves sleepless nights of prayer. Verse 5, I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night, my heart mused, and my spirit inquired. When times are difficult, people remember the good old days. You know, memory is a gift from God, and memory can be a blessing if we use it correctly. 
God gives us the ability to enjoy places and people who are no longer with us by using our memory. He doesn't want us to live in the past, but pleasant memories can be a source of happiness. And sometimes we need a bit of happiness any way we can get it. Verse 7, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? He's wondering if the good times will ever return. Sometimes when things are very difficult, a Christian may be tempted to think that the Lord has rejected them. Maybe the Lord doesn't like me anymore. Maybe I will never see good times again. Well, I know that's not true. If you're a Christian, it isn't true. Good times are coming. If not in this life, then in the next. Verse 8. Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? As Christians, we should know. And deep down, I think we do know that God promises us good times in eternity. If we didn't believe that, we wouldn't be Christians. Because that's what Christianity is all about. However, extremely difficult times here on earth can cause a person to wonder if God will actually keep that promise. That promise seems so distant. But we should not wonder. Because his word is true. And he will keep that promise to us. Verse 9. Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Every Christian is a Christian because they know they need God's mercy through Jesus Christ. They know that they can't afford to get what's coming to them. We're used to God's mercy. Not God giving us what we really deserve. But hard times can make us wonder if God maybe has run out of mercy. And maybe has decided to give us what we deserve for a change. Verse 10. Then I thought, To this I will appeal, The years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your mercies of long ago. During those difficult times, it's good to remember all the times that God has answered our prayers in the past and has given us what we've asked for in the past. If nothing else, that will help us to remember that God cares about us. And that can go a long way in providing comfort during stormy times. 12. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. In other words, the writer says, I'm going to think about all the nice things that God has done and continues to do. And again, doing something like that helps us to remember that God is a caring God. If we're only going to think positive thoughts about God when times are good, then we're not very good Christians, are we? God does not leave us even when we sin. So we should honor him with our thoughts and our words, both in good times and in bad. 13. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? Your ways, O God, are holy. God is holy. We think we know what that means, but we really don't. Holiness is a hard concept for us to understand because we're not holy. We don't have a point of reference, but that's what God is. He is perfect, flawless, completely pure morally, utterly incapable of thinking or doing anything wrong, incapable of having an unrighteous motive for anything that he says or does. God is holy. He is sinless. He is much too holy for us to approach. 
But through the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we may come boldly before Him. And that does not mean we may approach Him brashly. It means we may approach Him, but always reverently. 14. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Miracles are no problem for God. God invented the laws of nature, and He can turn those laws off or adjust them anytime He wants to. When He does it, a miracle occurs. 15. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. God redeems us as He did His people Israel from Egypt. He redeems us by His mighty arm. In other words, He redeems us by His mighty power. And if God doesn't do it by His power, then it doesn't get done because we sure can't do it. Every sinner, which includes all of us, have dug ourselves into a very deep pit because of our sin. On the cross, Jesus paid for our sins and provided a way out of that pit. That's redemption. 16. The water saw you, O oh God, the water saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. And this is talking about God parting the Red Sea for his people after they left Egypt. Using poetic language, the writer says, God, when you told the Red Sea to part, it didn't ask why. Didn't even consider not doing it. The Red Sea had respect for its maker and therefore immediately obeyed. See, this is talking about the importance of having a healthy fear of God. And I know the fear of God isn't the only motive for doing right, but it's a pretty good one. And it's a biblical one. 17. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Thunder, lightning, and rain all come by order of God. And the arrows here in verse 17 refer to lightning. Do you know that all lightning is God's lightning? Do you know that each lightning bolt is 37,000 degrees hot? 37,000 degrees, that is as hot as the surface of the sun. And God controls those lightning bolts. And knowing that should put the fear of God into people. Lightning and thunder are a show of His power. Eighteen, your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. God led the Israelites out of Egypt. He led them to the Red Sea, and then He led them through the Red Sea. God had a path prepared for His people all along. It was a path that they could not see because it was covered by the water, but it was there. God saw it. He prepared it, and when the time was right, He revealed it to His people, and they took advantage of it. They thought they were at a dead end, but they were not. There was a path there. And there are times when Christians feel like their life is at a dead end. They wonder what God can do, if anything, to make things better. There are times when Christians worry about the future as if there's no hope, but we should never feel that way. God has a path figured out. We might not see it, but it's there. God sees it. Psalm 78, verse 1. O oh, my people, hear my teaching. 
listen to the words of my mouth. God tells his people to listen to him. Now, notice he says, oh, my people. God has every right to expect that his children, Christians, will listen to him. No one should be surprised if the world doesn't listen to God. They don't know him. They don't care about him. They have no interest in him. They live by their wits and by their instincts, and in many cases by their feelings. But Christians are different. God's people are different. God's people hunger for the Word of God. That's what the Bible says. They understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So God calls on his people to hear his voice, and when he does, a normal Christian will be ready to listen. Verse 2. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. God's word should be passed on from generation to generation. The truth we receive from those who have received it before us should be passed on by us to others, especially to our children. The children of Christians have a right to hear God's word from their parents. It is the duty of every Christian parent to live the word of God and to speak the word of God. 5. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. One of the main reasons for Israel's existence during the Old Testament days was to keep God's truth alive in a world full of spiritual lies and idolatry. And the same thing is true of Christianity today. Christians are called to be a spiritual lighthouse, a lighthouse of truth in a world full of cults false religions, spiritual darkness, and people who have a very difficult time discerning right from wrong. Verse 6. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. God's word does not wear out at the end of a generation. It is as bright and alive and relevant today as it was when God first gave it thousands of years ago. So maybe we can't give our children wealth, but we, we are successful parents if we give them the truth found in Holy Scripture. 7. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget His deeds, but would keep His commands. Every generation has to follow God for themselves. Every generation must choose Christ for themselves. No child can live off the spiritual accomplishment of their parents. God says that every generation should remember his miracles. That means every generation should be aware of God's goodness and remember all his benefits. If we do not remember God's goodness, if we lose sight of that, then we will lose sight of his commandments as well. And soon God will become irrelevant. Verse 8. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to Him. You know, it's not enough to be as holy and as good and as righteous and as God-fearing as the previous generation. That's not good enough. There's always room for improvement. 
which is why one generation of Christians should learn from the mistakes of the previous generation. Someone says, Ma, my parents were not good. Well, then improve on it. God expects us to improve upon the previous generation's walk with the Lord. It's important to understand that we are even more accountable for our shortcomings if they involve repeating the mistakes of others with the full knowledge that it's wrong. Verse 9. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. The Israelite army had the best weapons available. But even their lead tribe Ephraim failed. They failed in holiness, therefore they failed in life. They failed in righteousness, therefore they failed in battle. And people today can have the best of everything, but if they fail in faith, if they fail in holiness, they will fail in life. At least the way God measures it. Verse 10. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by His law. Israel promised God that they would keep His commandments, but they quickly broke them. They quickly and willfully rebelled against what they knew was right. And God, of course, knew that they would do that, which is why He had established sin offerings beforehand. The sin offerings were the means by which one could get back on track with God. The problem with God's Old Testament people was that they willfully turned their back on God. They refused to walk in His ways, and furthermore, they refused to repent. And sometimes Christians do those very same things today. And I don't care if someone says they're a Christian or not. Living in sin and refusing to repent is an indication that they are a hell-bound sinner if they don't repent. Verse 11, they forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. Tell you something, if God's people would have remembered God's goodness to them, maybe, just maybe, they would have been more grateful and then more inclined to repay his kindness with their obedience. So that's another good reason to read God's word. It's important to have regular reminders of God's goodness because his goodness and his love inspires righteous living by the people who know him. And I think we'll stop right there and pick it up in verse 12 next time.